Good morning, it's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 11.50 in the morning here in New York on the Ides of March, the 15th of March. Beware the Ides of March, the gold and silver prices along with just about everything else, agriculturals, oil, gas, coal, copper, platinum, palladium have gone down sharply today. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I wanna talk about the markets and what's going on. And then I'm going to dig into some of the fundamentals on silver uh, because we haven't really paid attention to them for a while. And I'm just in a mean spirit. I'm gonna talk about Tris Peaker and Sam Crawford. Probably you don't know who they are. Tris Peaker has the record for doubles hit in baseball, National League Baseball, Major League Baseball. He holds, uh, he hit more doubles than anybody else. And Sam Crawford hit more triples. Now, neither of them are household names. Most people never heard of them, even you know a lot of baseball buffs. Everybody knows who hit the most hits and who hit the most uh, home runs. But these are the guys who move runners into scoring positions, doubles and triples. And that's very important in investing Sometimes it's good to swing for the fence and try to hit a home run. But investors who make a lot of money consistently and outperform other people over time also, also hit a lot of singles, doubles, and triples. I've talked about it in the past. And you know, you see movies and they actually are halfway realistic. Working Girls is the most realistic movie I've ever seen about Wall Street. Um, as my son said, it's a bunch of guys doing basic arithmetic while eating uh, bad sandwiches off of paper plates. Those trading desks at fund management companies and trading companies and investment banks, those guys are hitting singles, doubles, and triples, sometimes home runs, but they're there staying on top of the market, trying to pick off 0.5% here, 0.5% there. And yeah, you have to ignore those empty suits on the internet who tell you that all you have to do is buy and hold gold and silver because gold's going to $10,000 and silver's going to $100 or $300. You know, and ignore those people who talk about a 10 bagger. Uh, I think probably using sports uh, metaphors in investing is a sign of, hey, it's a warning sign. That's a it's maybe not a red light, but it's definitely a yellow light. Listen to the professionals who consistently outscore those guys by who keep striking out while promising $100 silver and $10,000 gold. Because that's how you make money in precious metals and in other investments. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on. We have seen Precious metals prices rise very sharply over the last three weeks as the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine has proceeded. We saw them rise along with a lot of other things. And we saw them come off sharply yesterday and even more sharply today. Funny because if you look at these two price charts of gold and silver, you can hardly see the declines. The declines are here. And you know the gold price and the silver price still haven't fallen back to their pre-war levels, um, but there has been a lot of decompression. Our view is that that decompression, you know, first off, it's no grand conspiracy against gold or silver. You've seen this in platinum, palladium, copper, wheat, soybeans got really actually we held up relatively well today. Soybeans, corn, other agriculturals, oil. Uh, it's a broad-based sell-off, partly reflecting the idea that some of that speculative buying in the early days of the R Russian invasion of Ukraine is dissipating and was probably premature. Not saying that the war is going to end soon or that the prices aren't going to rise, just that maybe they rose too far too fast. So there's a fair bit of profit taking in there. And in addition to that, you've seen interest rates, treasury interest rates rise. FOMC is meeting today and tomorrow. They'll make a statement tomorrow. They're probably going to raise uh, Fed funds rate by 25 basis points. Uh, and, you know, interest rates are preacting to that already. You know, the 10-year tre treasuries are now at 
uh, this morning they were at 2.14 percent that's up quite a bit from where they were at the beginning of the year it's actually up 10 basis points from where they were two days ago um and it, it you know so you're starting to see interest rates rise that raises the carrying costs and the relative uh opportunity costs to some extent of holding equities and commodities and other things so you've seen that and it's going to continue U.S. PPI, producer price index, came out today, and it was interesting because it was 0.8% for the month, and it was 10% uh, since February of 2021. And if you looked at it, almost all of the price inflation was energy on a producer level in February. Energy was over 8%. Everything else, well, there were a couple of things that were 1.9%, food and maybe one other asset. Most of the other components of the producer price index were off less than 1% or were up less than 1%. Uh, so it really was an energy phenomenon, ties in with our longer term views. Now, I really wanted to talk to you about silver and go over some of the fundamentals just to sort of bring you up to speed. I'm doing that because, yeah, those guys are out there talking about $100 silver or $300 silver again. You know, if they had any self-esteem, they'd find a different job, but that's beside the point. Here you can see the silver price. It has risen. It got up to $27.50 uh, a couple of days ago, last week. Uh, it's down around $25.50 as we speak. You can see that it hasn't risen as high as it did in August, July and August of 2020, when it got over $30. You can see it didn't rise, hasn't risen as high as over $30 as it did um, on that one day when the silver squeeze started, the squeeze that never happened. And you can see it didn't rise to $28 quite as much. But there has been an upward move. Price has come off and um, the price is much higher than it was from any period of time from 2014 through 20, uh, or the first half of 2020. And it's much lower than it was in 2011, 2012. So that's where we are. We're in a market clearing area in the silver market. This is from our 3rd of March Precious Metals Advisory. We come out with a Precious Metals Advisory within the first 10 days of each month. And those Precious Metals Advisories have a one month uh, outlook and a three month outlook and a two year outlook. And on the 3rd of March, so we're already into the war and the price of, of, of silver was up over $24. We were saying that we thought the range in March, April and May might be between $22 and $28. As I said, it got up to $27.50 uh, yesterday or the day before, and it's been as low as $24.35 earlier in the month. On an annual average or on a monthly average basis in the first half of March, it was $25.75. And you can see, I think we were predicting $25 for uh, a monthly average price, half over. So that was our expectation. Um, didn't see it going to 50 or $100 this month, but then for us. Silver market, the blue bars are sh net additions and net withdrawals from uh, surpluses, uh, surpluses and deficits. And those are sort of surrogates for investment demand, although they're not always uh, surrogate, uh, investment demand. We saw, for example, in 2020, a lot of silver that was coughed up by investors that was taken on by banks, uh, bullion banks, uh, as the buyers of last result, uh, resort through their market making. And you, you can see that from time to time. But you can see that you, know, you had this spike up uh, and we've come back off. And it looks like we're going to see a much smaller net addition to inventories, which reflects some weakness in investment demand. 
Silver fabrication demand, the two big areas uh, people look at these days are solar panels and silver use in electronics and autos. And you can see we have modest growth uh, projected for both of them. That may actually be curtailed in the auto industry because the auto industry continues to suffer from supply chain issues. Uh, solar panels uh, continue to grow modestly, uh, and they're at a very high level. They're at a record level in terms of the amount of silver that they're using, and solar energy is becoming ever more popular in ever more uh, parts of the world. Investors on the COMEX uh, have lightened up on their gross longs and their net long positions. They're still net long. They still have pretty sizable gross long positions. Their gross long positions are basically higher than they were at any point prior to say 2016. So there's still a lot of interest in gold or silver on the COMEX by investors, but it has come off sharply well from 2016, 2017, and it's come off sharply even from. And you've seen a little bit more propensity uh, by institutional investors to go short silver uh, compared to where it was in 2020 when the price was $14. It's easier to be uh, bullish when the price of silver is $14 uh, than it is when it's $25. And it's easier to say, well, maybe I will go short if the price is $25 and it hasn't gone to $300. Um, and the price was $14, $15 for several years before that. Max, near record silver holdings. You can see, you know, total holdings with including the eligible stocks held in COMEX registered depositories in the northeastern part of the United States are higher than they were at any point prior to the middle of 2020 uh, during the lockdown. And we had some tightness in that market. A lot of silver came into New York. COMEX registered stocks have come off also since late 2020, uh, but they're still higher than they had, were at any time prior to 2008. The way to look at them, compare them to deliveries. And you can see here on the left-hand side, COMEX deliveries of silver. These are silver contracts that are delivered via the COMEX futures contract. And you know, I've used this chart before to try to help people understand the real, the real silver market. And you can see back in the 80s and early 90s, the amount of silver that was being delivered through OMEX futures contracts was enormous compared to what it has been really since 2000. It did get up there a little bit in 2020 into 2021, but it's come back off. And it's very interesting, and, and those of you who have read our silver yearbooks or other longer term reports know from 1988, 89, you had a lot of investors selling silver. People who had watched the price go from $5 to $50, they were convinced it was going to $100 because some guy told them that it was. Uh, so they bought a lot of silver as the price went from $50 to $16 in two days. <laughs> Oops. Um, and then moved from $16 to $8 to $7 to $3.50. And in the late 80s, you had a lot of investors start selling. And by the year 1990, you had net investor selling of silver. And you had that net investor selling, selling of silver until 2005. And that high delivery rate in 88 through 94, 97, 98 actually represents a lot of investor selling. I will point out that when Berkshire Hathaway bought its silver in 1997, it took delivery of it in 1998, it did not use the COMEX. Other people who were had sold in the forward market to Berkshire Hathaway and were delivering may have accessed some of the silver that was in New York and shipped it to London, but Berkshire Hathaway's purchases were through the London market. The right-hand side chart's even more interesting because the orange line is the total inventories in COMEX registered depositories. 
And then the blue things, you can see it's the same pattern. The blue bars are deliveries. And that's the really important point. People will look at the open interest relative to deliveries and they'll ignore the fact that 99% of the open interest gets closed out and those people don't take deliveries. Oh, but if they did, there'd be not enough silver. Yeah, but they don't. They don't. Most people close out their open interest. So the real key relationship is open uh, is deliveries relative to available inventory. And here you can see that the ratio, we haven't put in a ratio here, but you can see that the amount of total inventories available to meet delivery demand has actually skyrocketed relative to delivery demands. This is the reality of the silver market. This isn't the fantasy world. This is how the silver market works. Sorry for all those guys who don't believe that, but if you're investing based on beliefs, I've told you not to. London inventories close to their record levels they sure aren't showing a tight market there. Uh, they rose very sharply in 2020 uh, as investors were disgorging silver. A lot of it came back to bullion banks and it showed up in their depositories in London. Come off a little bit, but it's still very close to high uh, to record levels. And the silver in Shanghai, similarly, you had a big surge in 2020 and it stays at very high levels. So London, New York, Shanghai, they're not really showing tight markets. And those investor demand actually has been down. Oh, silver ETFs. Yeah, their inventories are very high too. And I know, oh, well, those are investors, they won't sell. And in fact, they haven't been big sellers. But at the right price, a smart investor will sell. Or if the, you're not an investor, you're a stacker, and you're waiting for the shit to hit the fan, at some point the shit hits the fan and you're gonna take that delivery because you're gonna want that silver. So a lot of silver out there. I'll show you in a sec. Meanwhile, investment demand has come off. The bar on the left-hand side is the net changes, annual changes in ETF holdings of silver. And you can see that big spike in 2020. And we've talked about how a big portion of that probably more than two thirds of that spike of silver ETF holdings in 2020 were not actually investors. They were bullion banks. And the boy, you know, investors probably did about a hundred or maybe a hundred, between a hundred and 130 million ounces of it was investors. So it was pretty high, but it wasn't this high. But you can see 2021, how much lower it was. And then 2022 is obviously just through February, the first two months of February. Uh, and you can, it's actually off a little bit from the pace in the first two months of 2021. And the first two months of 2021 was when you had all those guys who were looking for 50 or $100 silver buying uh, an ETF, we'll just call it an ETF. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have a table which is Silver Eagle sales, the US Mint being the only national mint that publishes data on how many uh, precious metals, bullion coins it sells on a monthly basis. And you can see that in February, the sales of new Silver Eagles by the mint to dealers was less than half of what it had been in February of 2021. Steen finds that investors are not all that compelled to race into silver. This is a chart that we modified a little bit. We've always had this chart for decades of refined silver bullion inventories. Uh, we've added that green part, which is the coin inventories. Because as we've said and written extensively for the last 20, 30 years, there has been a shift away from bullion bars to coins. On, in terms of investor holdings. And there are a variety of reasons I won't bore you with it. But when you add the coins in there, you can see that while 
on a bullion bar basis, it looks like we've gone from about 5.3 billion ounces of silver in the late 1980s and refined bullion above ground inventories down to about 3.5 now. If you add those coins in, because investors have been shifting from bars to coins, you're actually basically back up there where you were in the late 1980s, when the price of silver was going from 16 to eight to three and a half dollars an ounce. You don't think it's going to three and a half dollars. Uh, we don't even think it's going to $10, uh, but there's a lot of silver out there. Ain't no shortage. And then again, I've shown you this chart. I'm going to show it again. It's good to be reminded when, when, when the guys are waving their hands and trying to sell their snake oil. It's good to be reminded. Silver mineable reserves in the ground and the reserve base, because uh, that's there's an issue of what resources are, and there's not good data on resources. But mineable reserves; those are resources that are economically mineable at current prices or at a record high. And if I had had time, I would have grabbed some data because you know the mining companies now are starting to report their year-end data for 2021. And most of them are reporting increases in mineable reserves. So the world's not running out of mineable silver and the world's not running out of uh, refined silver above ground. Plenty of stuff around. Our yearbooks will be coming up. We're coming up with our gold yearbook in a few weeks, uh, the first week of April. Rohit Savant, our lead uh, precious metals research director, is working very furiously on it. Hopefully, Carlos is. I know I'm supposed to be, but I've been a little bit distracted by events in the market. Silver yearbook comes out in early May, platinum yearbook in uh, late June. We have come out with our Platinum Group Metals long-term projections, which we take out to 2050. Uh, we updated that report and released it at the end of January of this year, and it's out there. You should be able to find somewhere on the internet uh, or somewhere. Uh, I know you can find it on our, our, our website. Uh, we issued a, a market commentary about short and long-term issues uh, in the PGM markets, because I haven't talked about platinum and palladium, but they've been kind of wild too, uh, thanks to Mr. Putin's war. Uh, we have a retail investment program. You can read about it on our website uh, and you can uh, go to our website and learn about all of our other services, including advisory services, asset management, commodities management, and more. That's all I have for today. I'll talk to you on Friday, I hope and expect. Bye.